This week I was reading an interesting article from Falkvinch. And uh, Falkvinch is the uh, founder of the Pirate Party and pretty well-known uh, libertarian uh, freedom pundit. And he's writing about Bitcoin and the core underlying value of Bitcoin and his basic premise is that Bitcoin seems to be vastly overvalued and partially caused by illegal price fixing. So his premise is that the current valuation of about a billion and a half dollars at about a hundred and something dollars per Bitcoin is actually vastly inflated and does not represent the underlying value of Bitcoin. And he bases this argument on doing an analysis of money velocity by looking at the uh, transactional velocity of Bitcoin and looking at how these Bitcoin are being spent. I think the equivalent in Bitcoin terms is uh, Bitcoin days lost, I think is the statistic uh, that we see most often. So, based on his analysis, the bottom line is that uh, Bitcoin should be valued at about a buck twenty instead of a hundred and twenty dollars. So he's saying it's valued uh, two orders of magnitude higher than it should be, and that the real economy is only about thirteen million U.S. dollars, not one point five billion U.S. dollars. Isn't that speculation? I mean, like, isn't isn't the whole price that Bitcoin has under it right now based on speculation? I think that's really the argument that Falkvinge is is saying. Is he's saying there is no market behind it. There is no transactional velocity to Bitcoin. It's uh, it's really speculation. It's basically price fixing speculation more than anything else, without any underlying fundamentals. Here's the thing, though. He uh, very conveniently excludes, right off the bat, drugs and gambling. So, um, <laughs> so the two biggest parts of the Bitcoin economy, no, they're not the biggest parts, but they're, com they're primary components. They're significant. I, I think he's talking about the relative velocity and liquidity of uh, the market and kind of dismisses drugs and gambling as illiquid, lacking in velocity, lacking in stickiness, uh, lacking in true value. And then he goes on to talk about what about normal products and services. And by the way, I, I am horribly paraphrasing and, and, and probably butchering his argument here. And obviously I disagree. But the, the, the bottom line is he's talking about the market being overvalued by two orders of magnitude. I think that this is how markets behave. Markets look to the future and say, okay, well, it's not about what it's worth today. It's about what it's going to be worth later. And so obviously the price that we have now takes into account a lot of people who have bought with the idea that they're holding as an investment. So I, I don't really, I think that it's hard to make the argument that it's not justified when so many people are using it as a means of saving. I think that savings has its place in a system like this, and it's not manipulation or, or speculation even really it's it's savings well yes i mean uh, basically i could take this exact article and to search and replace bitcoin for gold and based on falkvinge arguments gold has zero velocity because it's not really used to transact on normal products and services huh. and uh, is entirely a store of value so on his basis you know i guess gold would be overvalued by three orders of magnitude not two but does the value of bitcoin really depend on the velocity because I think that's the assumption at the core of this article. And if you accept the assumption that the value of Bitcoin does or should depend primarily on the velocity of the currency, uh, then yes, Bitcoin is overvalued. But I think that really reflects the fact that most people don't think that velocity is the only uh, core value characteristic of Bitcoin and that the savings effect, the future potential, the innovation, premium if you like, uh, looking at it a bit like a tech IPO, all of those factors play into the price in a way that they don't in other traditional commodities or stocks or other types of assets. You know, I've seen a lot of articles in the past. It's kind of interesting to see uh, Falk Binge writing about this because I've seen a lot of articles in the past, including from people like Max Kaiser, who say, no, 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 Bitcoin is vastly undervalued by at least two orders of magnitude, right? So maybe the truth lies somewhere in the middle, and that's what we're seeing right now in the current price. I mean, there's lots of people who say, oh, look at the amount of uh, Bitcoins that there will ever be in existence, and look at the world population, and look at the percentage of the world population who are Bitcoin users currently, and the potential for New Year's users, and suddenly you've got uh, $10,000 Bitcoins for one Bitcoin. And the price of a Bitcoin is what somebody is willing to pay for it. We've said that over and over again on the show. And there are lots of lots and lots of people determining that price every moment of every day through Bitcoin trading, you know, buying and selling. 
And that's the current spot price, the market price. That's what the price is. Part, part of trading on that price is reading articles by Falkvinge, deciding that you may agree with him and then selling <laughs> lots of Bitcoin or disagreeing and buying Bitcoin. So, you know, Falkvinge is doing the job of uh, adding more information to the market here. Right. But most people, it seems like either don't agree with him or there are enough people who disagree with him that it's it's holding up the market for Bitcoins at the current uh, market price. Not enough to hold it up at $10,000 per Bitcoin. But, you know, some of those people, as we as we said before, are banking on that in the future, that Bitcoins are going to be worth $10,000 or at least more than 140 wherever they're currently at. I'd love yep. to think it's rational pricing that has put the price of Bitcoin at 125, but then I look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average at 15,000, and I know that people are insane. <laughs> <laughs> you know that people respond to stimulus, and so that sort of brings up an interesting question. <laughs> you know, these uh, yes, in both ways. Is that a QE QE two pun or QE four? <laughs> wherever we're now, it was accidental, <laughs> but yes, indeed. You know, I mean, how we get the price in Bitcoin any way it goes is a total. You know, it's it's like it's like a black box, right? Because I mean, Mt. Gox has one price. When we were when I was talking with uh, Josh Rossi, he's talking about his Buttonwood software and how he wants to essentially collect prices from all of the Satoshi squares live that are going on, all, you know, everywhere all the time, and and also local bitcoins, and use that as a way to aggregate and generate a spot price. Because really, with with conventional markets, you have to use these broad measures. You have to pay attention to the entities like Mt. Gox because they're where all of the trading happens. But in in a decentralized network, and especially a decentralized network like we have with Bitcoin, where regulation is constantly kind of spreading out. First off, regulation is doing it, and then also just companies failing under the weight of their own success, as we've seen with Mt. Gox. Uh, it, it seems like the market is, is almost anti-monopoly and is continuing to spread out despite the fact that the incentives normally would have as large a concentration of traders on either buying or selling as, as possible. But here, that's not the case. Well, here's the thing, though. I mean, even if you look at these price fluctuations or price differences between the various exchanges, uh, they all cluster around a midpoint and they all form a very beautiful bell curve over time. And I know I can't say with extreme accuracy what the current price of Bitcoin is, but I can discount or rather um, dismiss a overvaluation by two orders of magnitude and I can dismiss that with a fair amount of, of statistical certainty. I can say, for example, that if all of these exchanges are telling us that the price is at about 130, the chance of the price being a buck 30 instead is one in 10 million, uh, simply by looking at the, the bell curve. You know, you can do that calculation. You can see what the probability is. It's, it's four, four standard deviations off the, the core. So, you know, you can say there's uncertainty in the market and that there's price fluctuation in the market and price uncertainty, but it's not in the orders of magnitude we're talking about here. There's no chance of that. So is this people picking their favorite reason? Like, you know, because some people look at savings like hoarding, some people look at hoarding like savings. It sort of is just semantics about how you're going to represent it. So is this people, you know, is, this, is, is Falkvinge picking the thing that he most wants? Bitcoin to be, which is transactional, because if it's transactional, then that means it's ubiquitous, that means it's changing the world. Whereas if it's savings, then maybe that's not so true. So maybe he's just focusing on that. And to him, that's the only valid sort of reason why there can be value there. When in reality, Bitcoin as a protocol, just like the internet, is super agnostic and doesn't care what goes on. It doesn't care what you do with it. And frankly, doesn't care what metrics you pay attention to it. Whatever metrics you're looking for, so long as it's something that's complementary with the overall protocol, you can find value for it or not in it. Value is an emerging metric. It's not a core aspect of the protocol. It's something that emerges from the social behavior around it. You know, at the end of the day, all of this analysis is trying to look at Bitcoin as an asset class and trying to figure out what type of asset class it is. Is it a currency? Is it a bond? Is it a stock? Is it a commodity? Uh, what exactly is Bitcoin? And the answer really is that Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency asset class. And we don't have analytical tools for figuring out the statistical value or the uh, quantitative analysis that needs to be done in terms of the value of that market, because we don't have the tools.
EasyDNS is the Swiss army knife for your domain names, helping meet their customers' individual needs since 1998. EasyDNS has been an outspoken critic of SOPA and CISPA. EasyDNS was an early supporter of Bitcoin, and now they are proud to sponsor this show. Do business with a company that shares your values. Get a 13% discount when you pay with Bitcoin. Go to bitcoin.easydns.com and be sure to use discount code LTB.